But the concept being that I can actually subscribe to niche content that matters to me. And I'll touch on some niches in some of the other in niche content on some of the other questions. But it's the ability to grab this content, have it on my portable device, and I can listen to it whenever I want. So I'm no longer tied to this having to tune in at four o'clock to listen to that particular show. I can have that content on demand when it's actually relevant to me. So yeah, a, um, a concept that uh, has started to uh, filter through. Um, the mainstream media as well is this, is this idea of called uh, time shifting, right. and without wanting to sort of bamboozle with, with, with more jargon, but uh, time shifting is essentially what uh, Mick's talking about, and that is you listen to content or read content when it suits you on your terms, on your, uh, in your time, and uh, you have websites and, uh, that are delivering audio content, as, as Mick's saying, and yeah, it caters for people who are busy, who um, spend you know an hour and a half on the train each way, commuting down from the central coast to Sydney, and you can get targeted content, you know, completely of relevance to you um, at a time when it suits you, as opposed to perhaps listening to the radio and, and just whatever the breakfast announcers happen to be. And uh, it, it's a far more personal, um, targeted media than we've been used to in the past. Communications point of view, what has the blog brought us and? How have they changed then? Just talking about numbers, I was reminded when they were talking about how many blogs there are, I read some research a couple of weeks ago, which basically means we've been here for about 15 minutes, so that's another 300 or 400 blogs that have been created just in that time. So it's a constantly growing and evolving process. When it comes to communication, I think uh, you touched on it, when you talked about the way you can access journalism now and pick and choose your, what, how, what you want to listen to, what you want to look at, and it comes down to relationships from a communication perspective, that is very, very important you now have companies in direct dialogue with their consumers. And uh, as a, from a PR perspective, we've never had that power before, that word of mouth and the fact that it's all real time. You can talk, you can ask questions and you can demand explanations on things immediately. So I think uh, companies now have to make a decision about getting on board and working out how they can actually use this and become part of it and do it in such a way that is open and transparent. Frank, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your blog because from my understanding you use it as a way to talk directly to your developers? No, absolutely. I, I've got a number of blogs and my, my business blog is, is really at the channel that, that we use to talk to the, our developer community here in Australia. So it evolved over frustration that, that I had and that I couldn't get the message out. In the past, you know, the way we communicate was, you know, direct mail, electronic mail, events that we'd have, going to user groups, but you know, the reach just wasn't there. You know, if, if I had to talk to every developer in Australia, which there's maybe 70,000, I'd be walking a long time. I'd be like that guy from Kung Fu, right, walking the land. And it's, that's, not, that's not scalable, whereas being able to blog, you know, post the stuff on a, on, a, on a website, people being able to subscribe to it, has actually allowed me to, to have this conversation. But it's actually allowed me to do a number of other things. A year ago, I, I put out a call to the community of, you know, if you're an Australian developer who blogs, let me know. And I created a list, you know, which is a, a, you know, a little document that contains all the Australian developer bloggers. And that list has grown to 80 people now. And so we now have a little community that's just encapsulated within that list. And these people talk amongst themselves. And it's not just me leading the conversation. At the end of the day, I'm not even, sometimes not even having a conversation. The conversation is happening amongst the community, which is what this is about facilitating. But you know, the, the communications I have with people is after they read my blog and I talk to them on the phone or meet them, they say, hey, you know, I've been reading your blog for a year or two years and you sound exactly the same as you write. And I go, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. You know, it's me <laughs> writing it, right? It's not like, it's not a PR company writing it or a marketing company writing it. I'm writing it. I'm there tapping away after hours or whatever to do it. And I think that's been the connection that we've had with these folks, you know. You know, they, you know they, they're hearing directly from me. They're hearing about you know, my experiences, about what's coming up in terms of the Microsoft technology, which they're interested in. They're hearing about other successes that have been happening, you know, in the marketplace. And it's coming through this unfiltered view of, you know, from Frank's perspective. And that's, you know, I think over the, the year or so that, you know, it's, it's been taken off, I've kind of, you know, that's built a, a, an element of trust, I guess, with, with my readership. And, you know, that stuff that, you know, is, is invaluable. At the end of the day. But within Microsoft, we've been really lucky. There's been a big movement to sort of be open and transparent and, and communicating. And we've, we've kind of got these, you know, a page of unwritten guidelines, you know, of things to do, you know, the page of unwritten guidelines, you know, things to, to, to do and not do. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, it's, it boils down to common sense, you know. If, if, you know, as, I, you know I, I, as the interview that I just did recently for the Bulletin, 
you know, we, we talk about, you know, don't talk about things that you don't want to see on the front page of the paper because that's where it's going to end yeah. up, you know, common sense. So, you know, we use the blog, we use it to communicate. Microsoft's been very supportive of it. You know, there's, there, there was a, a, a situation of a Microsoft employee got fired. It was actually a contractor. And what he did was he posted photos of Macs that were coming into Microsoft. And, but the, the issue wasn't that he posted the photos. He actually provided a lot of identification around buildings and locations and, you know, stuff that you don't want to have public because there's other risks around. You know, it's HR-related issues. And so that was the stuff. You know, some of the other famous guys that got done, you know, there was a Google blogger. He posted financial information, yeah. you know, publicly listed company. It doesn't make sense to kind of put that stuff out there. So it's really that, they're the guidelines. Now, as I said, I've caused trouble and I've posted, you know, communications I've had from customers. And my, I'm a PR person's nightmare, right, as a result. But what has actually happened is I've had this communication with the customer in the open as a result. And, you know, we've been able to, they go, Frank, why have you done this? And I'm saying, I'm having this conversation with this customer, but you know what, this question is a question that other people have. Let's put it out there and answer this question for others who don't have the, the strength, courage, interest to send, send me that request and actually solve that answer. And the results are always positive out of that. So, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel blessed that I work for a company that's really encouraging us to do this and push the envelope. And, you know, it's not just the blogging. We have a number of initiatives, I think, called Channel 9, which is showing mm. videos inside the, you know, talking in interviews with developers within Microsoft who are talk, working on products and projects. And it's great. You know, people are, are finally getting to see the inside of, you know, the, 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 the behemoth that is Microsoft. And I think that's, that, that can only be good. Yeah, it's also very important from a company's point of view. It gives us an opportunity if you are from a company and that you have bloggers to start open and, and uh, positive dialogue with your employees themselves. You've got to start addressing these issues straight away. There will be employees out there who will have their own blogs who will want to talk about things. And it's about internal communications, basically, making sure that you can talk to them in an open and honest way and have clear positioning and clear unwritten guidelines written down, as, uh, as you have, Frank. <laughs> exactly right. Mark, if I can ask from a news perspective, how has the blog changed the way that you work? There's a, there's a phrase that if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> and I think that definitely applies to, to, to journalism and the media industry. Uh, as I was saying before, you've got this idea that we used to just communicate to our audiences, and now we have to rethink the way we operate as a media company. We have to include um, our readers, uh, as it were, in, in the discussion. So that means uh, how do you use blogs in the context of your, uh, of your company? In our case, um, we've actually just launched a, um, a podcast um, to tap into the previous discussion. We have uh, a radio show effectively on the web and it's run by the Computer World Editorial and these guys are now digesting each week's news. You can download and listen to it. But the concept beyond the physical or you know, the event uh, of that on, on a weekly basis is that we're asking people to uh, engage in a conversation with us. We're looking for more feedback. We're looking for people to contribute their own ideas to uh, the issues that matter for that week. So uh, the, the, the important thing um, to remember is that uh, this is a, a really open um, way of us becoming part of the community that we serve as opposed to reporting for it. And uh, there's a real, there's a, that's a real big mind shift, I think, for publishers who are used to sending stories out into the ether and, uh, and not hearing too much back. Yeah, and there's a court case at the moment um, in San Francisco with Apple. There are a couple of Apple-related blogs that launched some information just before the recent Macworld, which was about three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. January. In, was it January? In January. Um, it wasn't January, was it? No. And Apple actually took them, I mean, Apple, for all their lovely products, are a very closed organisation. Everything's sort of done on the secret and done on the sly, and that's sort of part of how they, they get their products out there. And they, re like, I think in the last two weeks, they took these three um, sites to court and have actually had a ruling from San Francisco court that they don't have to continue, like, they don't have to, they don't have the rights of journalists' protection and sort of being able to cover their their sources, and they've actually been told they have to give their sources over to the court, and that's been put back into court again by the electronic EFF. Yeah. Mm, can't remember what EFF stands for. It's the Electronic Freedom Foundation, I think. Um, and that's now back in court again. So where that'll go? I mean, that's interesting. Where does a 
where does my personal blog sit in terms of a legal perspective versus a blog I might do for a company or my, my, my company blog? Where does a line actually drawn where I'm creating a news element and I'm actually creating a personal comment? So, that, I mean, that's going to be really, really interesting. And in that case, I think the blog sites will probably win over because they've got a traditional history of being a, a news type site over the last 12, 18 months, two years. In other cases, there's going to be a lot more of that. I mean, it's an issue that we're looking at. I mean, we just launched the Podcasting Network, which is a, a network to aggregate audio content. And we've got people providing shows from us out of the US and out of Europe and Scotland. And it's a big deal for us to actually turn around and go, where does the actual defamation cases lie here? If we've got someone doing a Microsoft blog or an Apple blog and actually write something about Apple, well, what are the chances of us being sued out of Scotland or something? even stranger. And that's the hard thing. It's difficult in a, in a traditional media world where you're probably only being really looked at in your own little, sh in your own little environment with the blogs because it is open up to a much larger audience. Mm. The possibilities are being brought in under US law very instantly because your blog and by their conditions your blog's hosted in the US or it's accessible from the US so you are completely liable by US law and you get your ass dragged over there. So where that will go, I mean that's going to be really interesting and there'll be a lot more of that over the next couple of months I think. Yeah and also at the core of that question is are bloggers journalists and um, that's I, I think in, in from a legal perspective still open to debate. My personal opinion is that bloggers are not journalists. There are certain conventions and expectations that the public have of journalists of what, uh, what, in terms what, of the way what, hmm? what? <laughs> whether they're actually delivered or not is a is a you know is a different is a different story. There's a perception and then there's reality. But uh, the extent to which the public has a perception of journalists is uh, is one thing. Bloggers, on the other hand. Uh, there's an expectation that this is uh, personal, that, that it's um, not, it, it might be, uh, it, it's, it's definitely biased, but it, it may not be objective, whereas um, journalism is, um, for better or for worse, pursuing ob objectivity, or, or at least balance, and, and bloggers, um, on the whole, are, uh, are not, um, not that way, because everyone has an agenda, everyone has a reason for writing a blog, and you'll always have this problem. So. It is going to be very interesting to see so which way the, 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 the legal system comes down. <laughs> so that would be the same reason that Dan Rather put out all that, all that stuff in America about uh, Bush that the bloggers then tracked down and actually he left his job for. Yeah, so... Yeah, because he, no, was, cause, cause he was showing some real, some real <laughs> journalistic foresight there and by not doing anything I think he called it right. editorial as opposed to news. Oh, okay. But um, <laughs> I, think, I think also another thing to, to remember as well from the, from the flip side is that mainstream journalists now are reading blogs and they have never done that before. I have some former colleagues in the broadcast media and they're always the slowest to pick up new technology and they now are reading blogs and getting information and sources from blogs. So they're not only directly influencing but are also influencing mainstream media and their reportage and coverage of events. People want to have a voice, they want to be heard and they want to say what they've got to say to the, the, the widest audience possible. And uh, from a, a state point of view, from a, a government point of view, it, it's going to be very hard for countries to legislate against something like this. Um, you, you're going to see more journalists and bloggers uh, going to jail and, and getting dragged into courts because of this. Um, it's not going to stop, so just how far that goes, I don't know. Um, but that's why this is so interesting, because it's, it's changing the rules of the game. It's changing the rules of how we consume media, how we, how we build media, and uh, the economics of that entire system that we've grown up with is, is changing around us probably faster than we realise. And Andrew, just continuing on from that, what do you see are the new rules for this new media, if we can call it that? Uh, I think Frank touched on it before when he talked about that the rules are basically self-imposed and, and it's becoming it's what, what you do do yourself. I think it's one of the more challenging points is, is actually how it will play out. I mean, in Iran, there's someone who's just been jailed, a blogger jailed for 14 years because he wrote about um, other online journalists and how they've been suppressed by the government there. So there are major changes. When it comes to the media, I think uh, when we talk about podcasting and video casting, that's where the media are probably going to find the real power of it. Um, that's where the real challenging bit is, the fact that you can be somewhere and immediately upload images directly straight away and that the lines will blur from, excuse me, the lines will blur from a person who is at the event for the journalist, re journalist recovering it. And also the amount of well, journalism is all about having checks and balances in place, and uh, this removes <laughs> there's allegedly checks and balances in place, <laughs> and so this will actually remove that, and that's that's one of the, the probably the most amazing and influential things that will happen to the media is that 
from the news event to the actual dissemination of it will happen immediately and there'll be no checks and balances in between. I mean, a great example of that is kryptonite. Is a, late last year in September, there were kryptonite locks. They manufacture bicycle padlocks. Um, I pulled down the dates for this. It's really interesting to see how it played out within a 10-day period. Um, on September 12, someone posted to a, a bike website on a forum that you could actually pick a kryptonite lock with a, the insides of a big pen, of the little plastic sleeve inside a pen. You could actually pick the lock within 10 seconds. So this was on a, on a, on a bike forum on the 12th of September. On the 14th of September, a couple of blogs and a couple of gadget type blogs picked it up. They did a, shot some video, put it up on the website, and it suddenly started getting out to people. On September 16, Kryptonite came out, the Kryptonite, the manufacturers, came out and said, no, no, the locks are safe, this is all cod's wallop, this is all fine, don't worry about it. On the 17th, so five days after, well, three days after it came out on the blogs, it was picked up by the New York Times and the Associated Press and started to get a bit of circulation. On the 19th, Technorati, which is a, the guys have mentioned, it's a site that actually tracks blog posts and what's happening in the blogosphere, as, they, as we, we like to call it, as they like to call it, as we like to call it. Um, Technorati said that there were over 1.8 million blog posts created in, what, seven days from when it was first announced on the forum that were actually referring to the kryptonite thing. On September 22nd, kryptonite finally came out. So 10 days after the forum, eight days after the first blog post, Kryptonite came out and physically said, yes, OK, there's a problem. If you send us your locks, we'll replace them. Last year, Kryptonite were expected to make $25 million US in revenue. That little exercise cost them $10 million US. So the blogs, while it was kept quiet for so long, and that was a great case of the blogs got the message out there, the media picked it up three, four, five days later, started to snowball, it just kept going. But it showed the power and the impact of what this can have in terms of getting this information out there to people and actually creating a talking point. And sort of a corollary to that is Kryptonite had an opportunity to actually mm. deal with that issue by, <coughs> you know, talking about it to the customer, but they didn't. They just kept quiet. They yeah. kept quiet. Yeah. They issued press releases. But they didn't, you know, you go to their website, there was no mention of it. Mm. And that kind of drove a negative, you know, vir mm. a, a sort of a yeah. negative virtuous cycle rather than a virtuous cycle. And it made people, you know, turned people against it. Had Kryptonite embraced the medium, spoken about it, been up front with their customers, at the end of the day this was about talking to your customers, I actually reckon they could have turned this into a positive rather yeah. than a negative. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about the death of new media and all that kind of stuff. I, I, don't, I, you know, I, I subscribe to that, but I don't subscribe to it. I actually think it's about, from the way I look at it, it's about having a conversation with your, your customer. This is, this, is, this is Clue Train, baby. This is about, you know, you know, who knows about the Clue Train manifesto in the room, okay? A couple of people. It was a book that was written a number of years ago, and it's all about, you know, markets and conversations. conversations. That, that was the buzzword. It was about being able to have a communication with, with customers. And they used the analogy of, you know, years ago in the markets and the bazaars, you'd walk around and you'd go, yeah, have a look at this cotton. Yeah, it's nice cotton, feel it. You know, you talk to the people that made it, bought it, sold it. We've lost that, right? We now have, it's, it, we have this a filtered view as opposed to an unfiltered view of all this stuff. And the power of blogging is it, it, it's technology that facilitates that conversation again. We can now start talking between the consumers and the, you know, the providers of the, of the product technology, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. It, ju it just so happens that the technology market has embraced this because it kind of lends itself to geeks, but it's, it works just as well. And I'll give you an example of it. There is a blogger, that is a Savile, Savile Row tailor in England. You know, they, they do bespoke, you know, custom-made suits. The, the blog is, you know, englishcut.blogspot.com. This is a, a tailor who makes suits and he's blogging about tailors who make suits. And it's fantastic. I find it fascinating reading. I want to go and get him to make me a suit, you know, because it's a fantastic, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to get on a plane and fly to England and get this suit made by this guy. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, that's true, right? But, but uh, he'd make me a cool suit. He'd make me a cool suit that I probably would wear. I'll no, give you my size it, and bring one back. My daughter's going to get married have one day, guy, so it? I'm going to have to wear a suit at some point in the future, right? But, the back. Yeah. but it's, that's the conversation that's happening. It's not a geek talking about, you know, Visual Studio. It's about us, Taylor, talking about, you know, his suit. English cut, there we go. You know, you can see it. It's, it is fantastic. It's a fantastic blog that... At, but at the end of the day, boil, it's boiling out of that conversation. Conversation from, you know, the creator to the consumer. And I think that's, you know, we can talk about the death of media and all that stuff. You know, I'd love to see new media take over old media. It's not, probably not going to happen in my lifetime. 
But the reality is, this is the reality, the conversation with your customers. And I think from a marketing communications point of view, that's the power of blogs, you know, and that's, I think, that if you harness, you will be able to ride the, the benefit because you're having a conversation with your customer at the end of the day. That's yeah. what it's about. I think Frank's, sorry, I think Frank's exactly right. I, th I th 